This video aims to explain how and why urban risk accumulation cycles affect local residents and their communities in Susan's Bay, and how they can be disrupted in a structural way. We have completed over three months of death study in the UK and two weeks researching in Susan's Bay with our partners, where we conducted five focus groups, 11 interviews with key informants, 17 in-depth interviews with residents and 52 household surveys. Susan's Bay, previously Big Wharf, is a coastal settlement and a national and transnational sea route. The settlement is situated on the edge of the hills of central Freetown, near the financial centre and the highest seat of government in Sierra Leone. 95% of Susan's Bay's residents are tenants and the average income per day is around 25,000 Leones. Susan's Bay is a relatively new area for human settlements. In 1954, main port activities moved from around Susan's Bay to Queen Elizabeth II Quay, and during the economic and population boom of the 1960s, Susan's Bay started becoming more of a residential area. People started squatting in the old warehouses and industrial installations, which severely lacked adequate services and infrastructure, and the unplanned expansion at this time happened in a mainly state-owned area. The settlement saw another significant increase in population during and after the Civil War, where people were trying to escape the continued threat felt in the rural part of the country, and the number of houses within the settlement grew from 325 houses in 2003 to 621 in 2006, and in 2017 the number of houses was estimated to be 2,460 houses. The area has become severely densely populated with geographical restrictions to growth which has led residents to expand the settlement through encroachment out into the sea, through a process of land grabbing which is called banking. In Susan's Bay, banking is mainly done by the use of rubbish, and the process can be seen with Google Images starting from 2005 to 2017. This growth can be explained by the high number of livelihood opportunities, as Susan's Bay is a key location for economic activities and trade. Guinea Wharf provides access to international trade to Guinea, Port Local Wharf connects people and goods to Freetown and the provinces, and the market connects Susan Bay's residents with the rest of Freetown. These characteristics make Susan Bay a unique settlement relative to other informal settlements in Freetown, due to its relationship with the rest of the city and beyond. This can be seen with the complexity of flows from the city and in Susan Bay, which have played a key role in defining Susan Bay and have contributed to the accumulation and reproduction of risks. This can be conceptualised through an urban metabolism framework, as many of these flows tend to be linear from the city into the settlement, and increase the negative distribution of environmental bars into the settlement from the city and beyond, moving entropy from the city to Susan's Bay. Urban metabolism shows how the city functions, what type of input there are, and how its outputs impact the environment around it. Through an urban metabolism framework, it allows us to visualise and understand the complex processes by different flows that shape the city and that can play a part in transforming it. In linear urban metabolism, the city is an organism where inputs into the system. In Susan's Bay, these flows are waste, water, people and trade. They are then used in a process of economic production and consumption and transformed into outputs such as waste, which may negatively affect local resources and environments. In circular urban metabolism, there is resource efficiency and closed loops where outputs are potential inputs. A circular metabolism resembles a natural ecosystem with efficient consumption, recycling and reuse of resource flows. Shifting from a linear to a circular urban metabolism means thinking about the city as a holistic ecosystem instead of an isolated organism. This way, there is a stronger prospect for achieving urban sustainability. Through an urban metabolism framework, we have identified four main flows affecting risks. Water, waste, trade and people. Water flows include the natural flows of Nicole's Quay and the sewer systems. The quality and overflow of water in Susan's Bay is very much affected by waste. Waste flow is highly present in the settlement due to residential activities, not only in Susan's Bay, but also in the rest of the city. The market and its economic activities also contribute to waste being deposited within the settlement, specifically on the coast. Susan's Bay hosts a vibrant petty trading community. These economic flows convince long-term residents to remain in Susan's Bay and also attracts newcomers, resulting in important flows of people. Overall, all these flows interact with each other and affect the spatial organisation of Susan's Bay, resulting in different levels of risk accumulation within the settlement. By trying to understand these flows, we identified three main factors driving risk accumulation cycles. 
unplanned expansion, risk displacement, and the lack of services and infrastructures. Unplanned expansion. Susan Bay's key location and trade flows have shaped the daily activities of the residents and their livelihoods. Indeed, 72% of residents interviewed happen to be traders. The economic attractivity of Susan's Bay, as well as insufficient institutional management, has resulted in the rapid and unplanned expansion of the settlement. Due to the lack of space, residents have resulted in banking, which was first adopted as a mitigation strategy to create a buffer zone and increase the elevation of the settlement to not be overcome by the sea. Banking is mostly a generational process done by long-term residents living in Susan's Bay for 15 years or more, trying to move out of dense areas. Embankment can be seen as a way to create new space and to dispose waste. However, banking techniques in Susan's Bay have resulted in various risks such as building collapse, health risks and further flood risks as the use of waste makes the floor unstable for construction in the long term and the floor will slowly sink, which expose residents to the tides. Contrary to other settlements, in Susan's Bay, banking is mostly done with solid waste instead of sand and mud. The high price of adequate banking and the unavailability of natural resources limit what residents are able to use to consolidate banking. Risk Displacement Within Freetown, risk is displaced from the hills to the coast as illustrated by solid and liquid waste. The situation has been exacerbated by increased deforestation that severely affected the flow of water leading to an increased number of landslides and floods. The location of Susan's Bay coincides with the downstream of the river. The river is used as dumping site to transport the waste and the risks connected to it outside from the uphill communities. Marbella, Magazine, Fullertown and Bumbertown displace the waste during the rainy season when Nichols Creek and its channels are already under stress. The chronic disposal of solid and liquid waste inside the river displaces hazards to Susan's Bay, which due to the lower elevation is exposed to constant floodings. This is brought about by the vacancy of regulation and enforcement of waste management within the city as well as the unsuccessful coordination efforts of the riverine communities. Susan's Bay, as a vibrant center of trading and residential activities, is also a producer of a high quantity of waste. Due to the lack of waste removal in the settlement, traders and residents displace waste from the upper part to the lower part. Waste is accumulated along the coast for banking. Eventually, not all the waste is used for the banking and ends up exposing nearby residents to further health risks. Lack of services and infrastructures Due to its informality, Susan's Bay, like other informal settlements, has a limited access to services and infrastructures, such as electric connections. The high price of meter connections in Susan's Bay results in many people having to subconnect through registered meters. Meter installations can cost up to 1 million neons and subconnections can cost from around 150,000 to 200,000 neons. Subconnections to meters are inadequately monitored and meters can supply around 20 different households. Many of these with substandard wiring and connections resulting in fire hazards. Many tenants are not provided adequate and separate cooking space and end up cooking in living spaces. This increases the risk of fires with an increased vulnerability for households that cook with bush sticks and coal and on second floors without concrete floors. There is also a lack of alternative fuel sources such as LPG. Susan's Bay also has inadequate response services and infrastructure for fire such as access roads, fire extinguishers, water and fire services. The main causes of fires have changed from cooking and lighting practices to electrical failure over time. The extent of fires is exacerbated by seasonal weather events, as well as densification and lack of fire services mentioned. As women usually do most of cooking activities, they are also exposed to small-scale accidents associated to cooking with fire, such as indoor pollution and burns. Sanitation facilities and drinking water are limited in terms of availability and affordability. 
However, this lack is more significant in the lastly embanked part of the settlement. The sanitation facilities in this area are mainly made of hanging toilets with an average cost of 500 leons per use. The many people who cannot afford the hanging toilet have to open defecate. This leads to a substantial increase in health risks. Services for water and sanitation have rarely been co-produced, resulting in unaffordable prices and high levels of vulnerability. Children and pregnant women are particularly sensitive to waterborne diseases and often pay a higher price to get water in plastic bags instead of using the taps. Susan's Bay is also affected by a relevant disparity in the drainage systems, which implies different levels of flood risks within the settlement. West of Guinea Wharf, the settlement has three main drainage ways, whilst the eastern part of the settlement is affected both by lacking sufficient drainage and an increased risk of flooding from the creek. The negative linear nature of many of the flows leads to risk accumulation as explained previously. We seek to disrupt them either by breaking these negative flows or by turning them into circular flows. We need to create a strategy focusing on a circular urban metabolism system and to focus on the different scales at which these flows operate. Over time, many stakeholders have tried to disrupt these flows with risk management strategies such as mitigation, preparedness, recovery, response and different interventions. Some of these strategies have had a positive impact. For example, we found high levels of governance and self-regulation by which residents were policing each other on cooking practices or electrical connection safety. However, in some cases the lack of coordination creates duplication or opposing outcomes. Other issues such as the lack of funding, knowledge sharing and local consultation by the government further weaken actions for risk mitigation. We believe that the strategy with a method of co-production at its centre is needed to overcome the disjunction. For citywide transformative change, different actors and their initiatives need to be coordinated to develop multi scalar partnerships. Co-production strategy can also be an opportunity to empower and legitimize existing actions. In this sense, we can look at the co-production of knowledge and infrastructure, which can be included in each of the three factors of the risk accumulation cycle mentioned previously. In order to manage the flows of water and waste flooding in Susan's Bay, cooperation and coordination needs to happen at the city scale level. Reforestation requires a strength of collaboration between Ministry of Lands, Country Planning and the Environment and the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Food Security to regulate the hill areas used. Regular official control and constant monitoring can ensure that the area will be protected. Reforestation will help retain excess rainwater, reducing the damage caused by floods and prevent extreme runoffs during the rainy season. Inefficient waste collection leads to waste being disposed randomly and entering the river, even exacerbating floods due to its obstruction. This is how the waste and water flows inherently link with each other. The waste collection system needs to be improved and reorganized at the city level in order to avoid disposal within Nicole's Creek. The implementation and efficient collection among the riverside communities should be combined with the creation of new dump sites around the whole city to relieve pressure. Under city level corporation, improvements to the housing sector also need to be made. Residents of Susan's Bay have moved here because of cheap rents and business opportunities. In order to mitigate the increasing population of the settlement, housing opportunities need to be developed around Susan's Bay and in the rest of Freetown. Freetown City Council could create partnership with the private sector to provide affordable housing options around the city, especially in the city centre. FedERP, through its savings groups, is already working towards affordable housing options outside the informal settlements. We suggest that the Freetown City Council and FedERP share their knowledge and work together for future housing projects. At the community level, the banking process needs to be analyzed further in order to be controlled and stopped to mitigate current and future risks associated with banking. In this sense, the lack of space as well as unmanaged waste disposal in Susan's Bay has to be addressed. Instead of expanding horizontally, the settlement has to expand vertically by building up. Existing parts of the settlement have to be consolidated through savings groups and cooperation with the community-based disaster management committees and NGOs. Savings groups already exist in Susan's Bay, however, these efforts could be brought to a larger scale with more members and greater coordination. Some savings groups are under FEDERP, but not all of them. 
These groups need to collaborate in order to avoid duplication and to maximize the use of community savings. Consolidating the settlement will also provide an opportunity to prevent common risks. Small risks connected to an evacuate cooking space needs to be addressed in all parts of the settlement and housing should have a 4 feet distance between one another. New houses also need to be built with protective wall skin and rising the threshold level to prevent water from coming in during floods. This coping mechanism is already being put in place by some residents, but it's still far from being mainstreamed. Currently, two types of savings groups exist under FEDERP, individual and community savings. Community and individual savings groups also need to be combined and to improve mobility, especially between the ports and the market. Building concrete roads and trade routes will improve trade efficiency and on the long term will increase mobility and the amount of goods traded in and out of the settlement. Community savings, in collaboration with the state and FEDERP and the NGOs, need to develop further toilets and water taps, especially in the coastal and eastern part of Susan's Bay. In addition, efficient drainage systems need to be developed, especially near Nicole's Creek, reinforcing already existing efforts made by YMCA, Gold Sierra Leone and the local Disaster Risk Management Committee. Savings groups should also be diversified and be used for electrical connections. In addition to reducing the subconnected households of 1 meter from over 20 to the safer amount of 10, we also suggest that higher quality equipment should be introduced with a community-based disaster management committee checking frequently the quality of the connections. Also, the 10 households should save together to share the original cost of the meter and the connections. In order to manage waste within the settlement, we suggest the creation of collection points to collect the waste that is produced in the community at certain points from where waste trucks can pick them and then dispose in the dump site near Fish Street for easy access. Freetown City Council will provide the community with bins and tools for the collection and local committees will be in charge for the process. Youth organizations, the Community-Based Disaster Management Committee, WASH and FERDUP will support the process by providing information and raising awareness courses for the residents in Susan's Bay in order to change people's habits on disposing and recycling waste. YMCA, FEDERP, WASH, Community-Based Management Committee and other NGOs have already contributed in cleaning areas that suffer from waste accumulation in Susan's Bay, such as the Nicole's Creek, but they have faced opposition by the residents. By consolidating meetings from different actors in the community, people will be informed about who is benefited from cleaning the river of the drainage in order to support actions like this. Moreover, in order those actions to be more sustainable, all the actors mentioned have to work collectively. In order to facilitate these changes for Susan's Bay and the rest of Freetown, trade flows have an important role to play. Some trade flows have been able to close the loop. Small plastic bags are being shipped from Susan's Bay to Guinea. It has been a way to recycle waste, but also to increase international trades. However, if Freetown was able to close the loop related to the recycled plastic business by reusing their own plastic rather than exporting to Guinea, then Freetown would be more self-sufficient and also the product prices would be reduced and would improve the local economy. We propose that further research on these flows needs to be done in order to understand how these economic flows can help to close the loop. To come out for the disaster for the, team, for the next 10 years, I want to see more development in my community. Not taking the people out of the community, but take the slum out of the people. That I want to see.